Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Dumaze, working at a, as a software engineer at Google. I've been at Google for now 10 years, and uh, it has been a very exciting journey, um, mostly in TCP, but also in general networking stack in Linux. And so I've been traveling in LPC last month. I, I got COVID, so initially I planned to join you in Lisbon, but um, COVID has been um, difficult for me. So I canceled my trip to Lisbon. And so I'm presenting remotely today. Um, so whenever Jamal and others ask me to do some presentation about TCP, I'm very often like, um, I feel some kind of uh, imposter syndrome for some reason. And then I prepare my slides and then at the end I say, oh, interesting stuff. So maybe not that imposter syndrome. <laughs> so um, let's present um, today uh, the state of the union in TCP, uh, Linux TCP land. So I will present um, roughly what happened in the last year um, in terms of um, development and attempts of new features which are not yet uh, there. So I will present um, an overall health status, um, an update about Big TCP, which was presented last year in NetDev. Um, I will give some words about hardware Jero and software Jero and why uh, RSC, which is the some vendor name about um, RS uh, at all, uh, is broken. Then I will talk a bit, a bit about copy or not copy, like uh, aqua, aqua um, zero copy, and some interesting uh, rediscover about uh, some feature that Tom Herbert uh, added years ago, but uh, takes no cache copy. Then I will uh, talk a bit about TCP memory control and charging. Uh, uh, some updates that we did this year and that we plan to do for the upcoming month and years. Uh, I will present some optimization that have been done in networking uh, namespace, but also in various um, uh, scalability issues with uh, connect or bind um, lately. I will talk a bit about a new feature called TCP DDB, which is a direct data placement or TCP direct. Um, I will talk very lightly about PSP, uh, PLB, and TCP uh, AO, which is a kind of a MD5 replacement. So let's start right now. Uh, so, yeah. First, I will start by just stating maybe not something very obvious. Uh, TCP is still very active. Um, I remember when I joined Google 10 years ago, uh, I met some folks at Google that were like very surprised that um, I was going to work at Google for Linux TCP networking stack. They were claiming that, oh, it's dead. We are all doing uh, user space uh, nowadays. So what's the deal? <laughs> and then 10 years after, well, we are still there and TCP is still very strong and going some big, big progress. Thanks to a lot of contributors, uh, reviewers and maintainers. So I gave, I gave some partial list. Um, some people are missing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank everybody uh, about uh, the support we have for TCP in general. Um, at first, uh, um, we had some few security issues this year, last year, uh, compared to the prior years. We had only something about privacy, privacy issue, uh, meaning that uh, some security researchers uh, found that um, the initial sequence number chosen by TCP at connect time was not secure enough, as is it was using a secret, which is boot time generated at every time you boot the host, which was possibility you use as a fingerprint. So basically, uh, if you have an Android device or whatever uh, Linux device on the wild, 
um, by carefully installing some gadgets, you could uh, track, uh, attackers could track you uh, um, even if you were using uh, um, cryptographic um, uh, data in your transfer. So that was uh, pretty nice. The change was quite easy. We just increased the size of the secret and made some slight uh, adjustment about that. So yeah, I'm happy because um, I'm, I'm very often scared about a new discovery by people about TCP and packet of death. And well, it seems that we had no uh, such issue uh, lately. So we'll give an update um, to Big TCP, uh, which was presented last year. And so we landed the patch in Linux 5.19. Um, I think it was in May or something like that this year. So it was a joint effort uh, with Coco uh, and reusers like Alexander Duc and myself. I think the only missing part uh, today in Linux kernel is uh, an increase of the max SKB frags, which is uh, the number of frags uh, that an SKB can have. So by frag, I mean page fragment. So that's uh, the struct um, SKB shared info. You have an array of 17 frags. And for big TCP needs, we had to increase that to 45 uh, because we wanted to send and receive uh, packets up to 180 kilobytes. Why we chose this value? Uh, we could have chosen something bigger, but uh, having an array, a big array was uh, potentially more expensive uh, because some algorithm uh, basically at receive message have to scan the array to find uh, the point the, from which to copy the data because the array doesn't have a direct access. Uh, you have to basically uh, scan it because each frag has a, an offset and a length which is not uh, known in advance. So there is no direct access to particular offset in the SKB. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I give more details about this uh, choice uh, in this uh, slide. So status about the performance of uh, BTCP um, today uh, using 200 gig uh, link. With a BTCP, uh, the standard net perf benchmark can reach something like 90 gigabits um, on one flow. That's of course um, is on our um, network with 4K MTU, right? Um, if you are using smaller MTU, maybe you won't get this um, throughput. With big TCP, this value reach 120 gigabits, so it's a nice improvement. Um, if you eliminate the bottleneck, which is in this case the receiver uh, copy. Uh, using TCP and map uh, TCP zero copy, uh, we can reach about 170 gigabits per second in one flow. And then the bottleneck here in this case is the sender uh, doing the copy. Um, if you try to do zero copy on the sender to get higher throughput, you actually get slower <laughs> throughput because zero copy on the send path is not very efficient. Um, it's, it is actually more expensive in terms of memory management. Um, every time we do the, you need to grab a page ref count on the user page. Uh, there are some extra um, steps. And it turns out that the kernel send message using 32 gigabyte pages is much faster. If you have a CPU uh, capable of doing fast copies, which is the, the case of this CPU, uh, which is an Intel Xeon Platinum, uh, the overall cost of extra page ref count um, in the MM layer is not worth it. So yeah, that's interesting. So 
And that's, um, that's going to introduce the next point of my presentation, because uh, we tend to consider that zero copy is the um, absolute uh, key for performance. But the point of the problem is that x86 CPU uh, have a very small page size, 4K. And so if you have to add some extra steps to keep track of this page, basically elevating a rev count and then decreasing it uh, later when the hack comes back, um, it turns out this memory operation, which you use lock, um, locked atomic ink or decrement are maybe more expensive than just copying 4K. So maybe we could try again and do copy, but more efficiently, right? So that will be covered uh, after this uh, following point. So um, with big TCP, um, we wanted also to use the hardware zero, uh, which is called um, LRO on Somnic or RSC for Microsoft uh, specs. And so the problem of the hardware zero is that most of the, very often the hardware zero is limited to 60K um, or 64 kilobyte payload. Uh, why? That's just because they are, they are providing one header and then the payload uh, after the header. And the payload, uh, the header contains a 16 bit to in the IPv4, IPv6 header to contain the payload length. And so we are limited to 64K, right? And so that was the point that, that I explained last year about um, BTCP. So basically we had to insert a Jumbo header to allow bigger payload per, per packet. And so if you have a NIC with hardware zero providing 60 kilobyte uh, packet, then big TCB wouldn't work because this zero packet wouldn't be aggregated in the software zero stack until uh, six, Linux 6.1. Actually, we did a change in the zero stack to um, to let it aggregate zero packet among. And so but if you receive, let's say three uh, big uh, 60 kilobyte packet, we can still aggregate them. Until, of, of course, unless you have a push flag or something uh, terminating the the, the, the the GRO aggregation. So all the, the parameters that are used today, like sequence number, TCP options, push flag or fin flag, whatever flag, which needs to flush the, the packet to the upper stack. So with this change, we are now able to use a hardware GRO plus software GRO and cook a big TCP packet in the software GRO stack. And so hardware zero is nice <laughs> unless um, the vendor, the NIC vendor is a bit too strict about the rules um, for aggregating packets. And very often there are vendors are just using the Microsoft RSC specs, which were very strict. So for example, if you receive a TCP packet with TCP option, RSC mandates that the only recognized TCP option are TCP timestamps. So the RFC is 7323. And there are some various rules about values that can be aggregated. Um, but in the end, it makes little sense because um, whatever option you put at the sender side, you would expect the receiver side to be able to aggregate the same, right? And so TSO is just splitting a big packet into multiple frames, one MSS at a time. And normally the TCP options are copied over for all the segments. And so you would think, oh, whatever value are in the TSO packet, TCP option space, they should be just fine. And the receiver should aggregate them without logging at the content of the value. So the rule, the rule should be only if the TCP options are the same between packet A and B, 
And then, of course, all the other logic about TCB sequence, uh, to checksum, whatever, are in place, which would aggregate. So, yeah. But today, it's not the case. So if you, for example, have a TCP bidirectional traffic, it's quite often that you have options that are maybe TCP timestamp plus other options like SAC blocks or many other TCP options, which are standard, but which are not recognized by, by RC. So RC performance um, becomes very small <laughs> under stress. And so instead of having some RC, uh, which could help the CPU under stress, it's the opposite. Basically, RC becomes useless. So that's why hardware zero plus the software zero save us because the software zero do, will do this, the good thing and aggregate packet and lower the CPU cycle cost under stress. So that's that was a very critical for us, I think, and for others. So yeah, on this slide, I just uh, repeat uh, um, my, my my proposal about just you know uh, allowing uh, aggregation of packets if they are share the TCP option, and not look at dissecting specific option. Uh, it's very common for congestion control uh, writers or anyone to add specific option. We have now uh, BPF filters to allow for uh, business uh, logic using private TCP option. As, as long as the packet don't uh, go to the global internet, it should be fine, right? So, yeah. So we are back to the um, discussion about copy or not copy. Um, so, yeah, zero copy is complicated, uh, especially for the receive side, because as I explained um, a long time ago about uh, TCP zero copy, you have to deliver page, complete page. And so your packet size should be a multiple of 4K and then in x86 world. And so uh, it's it's not going to work on the global internet where the MTU is still 1500 bytes. Uh, so maybe we should revisit uh, and maybe we should make sure that the copy we are doing are efficient. So it's particularly interesting to look at AMD CPU case. Why? Because uh, AMD APIC CPU, like a ROM or Milan, uh, lack DDIO feature. So DDIO feature was added uh, by Intel like more than 10 years ago. And so the idea was to allow the NIC to put incoming packet directly into the CPU cache, level three cache of the, of the CPU. And in the opposite way, the transmit, um, do DMA uh, from the CPU cache to the NIC. But guess what? On the AMD uh, CPU, uh, this concept doesn't work because the, the design of the CPU cache is not the same. There is no single level three cache, so because uh, the, the CPU is, uh, is split in four die, so four different uh, units. And so the various optimization we did in the past are no longer correct for AMD CPU. And so maybe we should revisit the, um, the choice we did about TX no cache copy. And so maybe I should explain what is TX no cache copy. And so TX no cache copy was added by Tom Herbert um, in 2011 as an option, uh, it tool um, option, telling a TCP stack during send message to not do a copy using regular mem copy, load from user space and store into kernel memory, but change the way the store was done using a non-temporal hint uh, to not populate the, the CPU cache. And I guess uh, Tom Herbert did that uh, before the DIO was um, a thing. 
And so it was efficient when he did his test in 2011. But three years later, um, Benjamin and others uh, noticed that this change was actually harmful. So whenever you, you, you were using MoveNTI on Intel CPU and Nick uh, using DDIO, uh, the result was actually less efficient. Why? That's simply because uh, when you do the copy using MoveNTI, the, the data is stored into main memory, but then later the NIC has to DMA, and the DMA is going to go through a level three cache anyway. So if the level three cache is hot and having is having the data you want to transmit, the NIC will get it immediately. If, it, if it's not in the level three cache, the CPU will load the memory from, the, the cache line from the memory and will populate its level three cache uh, while the DMA access is uh, ongoing. So just do the copy using non standard uh, store, which are faster than moving TI, and that's just faster. But again, on AMD, that's maybe not the case, right? So we did some tests and um, turns out that it's, there is a big difference if you re-enable uh, takes no cache copy on IMD. <coughs> so uh, maybe we could do a neutron change to add some kind of syscontrol uh, to turn on automatically uh, takes no cache copy for physical NIC for IMD CPU. And so in terms of um, performance, performance number, uh, you can see here that's quite big because if you are using one uh, CPU to do the, um, the transfer, like a um, net perf or with one flow, the max throughput we can get on the AMD ROM is about 80 gigabits with, again, 4K MTU and everything aligned and tuned. And then if you just enable takes no cache copy, well, takes line rate and so probably above that if I was using a higher speed mix. So that's pretty um, interesting. And by doing that, you also know that you are not going to waste CPU cache. So instead of having, let's say you have more than one thread sharing this um, CPU die, uh, this other thread will keep its own data hotter in the CPU cache. So overall, um, CPU usage will be more efficient, right? With less um, cache line flipping, uh, eviction, and reload from the, the memory. So, takes no cache was easy, just an ETH tool to change. The code was there. Um, fortunately, it was added um, 10 years ago or 11 years ago, and it was just turned turn off um, by just uh, the default setting. So, it was it's very easy to turn it on again. What about the receive side? Because on the receive side, we might have the same issue. Uh, right now, whenever you do the receive message system call, Ultimately, we want to copy buffers from kernel space to user space. And it's copy out, which is basically a mem copy with some exception handlers, just in case of a fault, right? So it's a mem copy. And the kernel has some different versions of this mem copy, uh, depending on the CPU capabilities. Uh, some CPU are very fast doing just rep move SB, and others uh, must be more careful and needing some load and store using eight bytes at a time. And so there are some alternatives for doing that. Um, but in the end, uh, the load and the store are going to populate the CPU cache, right? Uh, but when we receive traffic, the frame is read once, right? The, the DMA from the NIC uh, populates data into a kernel buffer, which has allocated by the NIC or by user space if uh, FXDP is used, but ultimately this memory is going to be read once. So putting this data in the cache makes little sense, right? User application might, after the copy, uh, reload the destination, right? Uh, you copy the data in user space and then user space can do whatever it wants on the, the data it has copied from the kernel. But the, 
the kernel buffer is going to be freed, right? And so it's going to be reused probably by the NIC because NIC have some page pool uh, optimization. So they try to keep the page for themselves in the receiver ring buffer and they turn to re recycle it if it has been consumed fast enough by user space. And so if you load the data into the CPU cache while doing the copy, the, the load, the load of the copy, then the NIC later will have to uh, mess again with your cache, right? Because whenever the DM access is uh, happening from the NIC to the, D, the, the memory, the, the, the CPU snooping will say, oh, my cache are now dirty. I need, I need to evict them, like, or, like flush them. So that's extra work for the CPU and overall. So could we just, just use a, the equivalent of move in TI, but for the opposite direction? Hmm. That's a question. Well, uh, unfortunately, it's complicated because move NTI is, is only for the um, store. So when you store a register into memory, you can give it a hint. But there is no equivalent instruction for the load. Um, so are we stuck? Maybe not, because it turns out that AVX, um, which is basically standard in modern CPU, have has such a functionality with the move and DQA instruction. So there are multiple variants of this instruction. Let's look at the variant just using 16 bytes load. Um, um, there are some constraints about that because uh, the kernel is not supposed to use FPU or MMX registers. Um, it can, but it's complicated. It has basically uh, to save and restore them because whenever, uh, let's say, user space call a system call, normally system call enters the kernel without saving or touching the FPU or MMX register because by definition, the kernel is not supposed to touch them. So we save a lot of cycles not saving them at the entry of the same core and restoring them at the exit. But in this case, we need to save and restore them. So we could write a loop um, using one single MMX register, but turns out that it's maybe not good enough because um, there are some feature on the CPU doing some things about having a single bit to tell, oh, some, something like this thread has used a FPU or XMM register. So if you set the bit by just using the one of X instruction, basically you force the, the, the CPU, the operating system to load and store everything, all this, the FPU contexts, which are big. <laughs> so maybe, um, yeah. So we have to evaluate that uh, possibility make sure that the extra cost of saving and restoring whatever state is needs to be saved and restored um, is not going to defeat the gains that could be uh, brought by using the, this uh, specific instruction. So tests are still ongoing. Um, I hope that next year will or sooner we'll present some actual patch to the community. So next, I'm going to talk about TCP memory control. Um, it's it's complicated again. You want for efficient TCP memory, uh, TCP uh, flows, you want to have enough buffers for either the transmit or the receive. Because of the fact that packet might be retransmit, you need to copy to keep the, a copy of the packets in the return queue. Uh, until you receive uh, the acknowledgement, right? And so if you expect, let's say, to send um, at a given rate and a given RTT, a given distance of, let's say, 20 milliseconds, you need to keep, to keep actually a lot of memory. And so people don't think about it, but um, the default on Linux is something like six megabytes per, per TCP socket. 
but six megabyte is huge. Like if you have one million circuit on a server, then you can compute the, the result. It's absolutely insane, right? And so we have this notion of central um, TCP memory allocated uh, counter, which tracks the sum of all the memory allocation. And we want to keep it small enough, like about 10% by default. But that's global, right? So if you want to share a server with multiple jobs, with even using networking namespace, proper container, whatever, um, a job can very easily eat all TCP memory if it's malicious or buggy. And other jobs on the server won't be able to grab memory for their own use, right? Um, and so the first problem we had to solve was that the each socket has had a local cache, which was the which was called forward allocation cache, which could grab up to two megabytes per socket, added to the receive queue and the send queue uh, needs. So that's uh, that's interesting because even if your flow was using a lot of memory and then became idle, the forward allocation part could still use up to two megabytes. So again, two megabytes is way too much. And so that was done because we wanted, I, 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 when I say we, that's, I don't even know who wrote this code like uh, 20 years ago. Um, the, the goal was to avoid touching this global variable, TCP memory allocated, too often. Because touching a central variable is costly, right? You need uh, it adds for sharing, so it's very, very expensive. And so the thing is, we can just adopt techniques that have been used for a long time in Linux kernel. So sharding a counter into per CPU uh, cache. So instead of having one million per circuit cache, now we have just a per CPU cache, which is a bit more scalable, at least with um, nowadays uh, platforms with 256 or 500 CPU. So this change uh, went in Linux 6.0. Um, that, that, that was a bit um, challenging because uh, we hit very soon, and I think that was a um, kernel bot, uh, Intel uh, bot, which discovered a regression with this patch because um, if you are allocating um, data from the per CPU cache, you still need to uh, do the main CG um, charging. And so if you do the main CG charging um, for small units, every time we do a send message or a receive message, that's, that was hitting some bottleneck on MCG uh, none. So basically, uh, Shaquille had to send a patch series to solve these uh, issues. It was mostly a for sharing and, and a bit old uh, numbers about per CPU cache again. Um, MCG was also using a per CPU cache, but uh, the, the unit per CPU was too small. So it was still um going to the central allocator too often so it it has been solved so yeah we can proceed and go a bit further so i think the um, what we want next in the future is to really uh shift from a model where you have a global tcp mem control which is by default about 10 percent of the physical memory to something more granular where each job can account the TCP um, storage into its own mem CG. So if you allow a job to grab one gigabyte of memory, it should be for everything the job is using, including TCP uh, sockets. That's the goal. And so hopefully it can be done soon. Um, then what next? Uh, this year, various optimization have been done um, in TCP stack. So two of them are listed here. 
Koniyuki added an uh, optional per network namespace TP CCPH table. Um, so if you have a regular server or even a beefy laptop today, uh, the TCP hash table the, of the initial net na namespace is shared by all the, the new network namespace you create. And this hash table has uh, half a million slots. It's big, but maybe not so big for specific needs. So if you run many, many different containers with different namespace, maybe you want each of them have a private table so that um, the time spent to look up a particular socket on a big hash table is smaller. The time to just use SS command to, you know, dump all the established socket or all the socket and TCP socket on the the system is dependent on the no total was dependent on the total number of sockets um, in the global eHash table, but now after dispatch, a job can say, "Oh, I'm not going to use more than 1,000 sockets, so maybe I can just have a 1,000 slot hash table, and that should be good enough for me." And so everything is going to be faster, and lookups are going to be fast. Uh, yeah, so. And in the opposite scale, uh, maybe a big, big job uh, wanting to deal with 10 millions of circuits wants to have a bigger hash table so that the lookup uh, spend less time um, uh, looking at the large, long hash buckets. A second patch uh, described here uh, um, is a change um, to add a new hash table uh, for bind um, at bind time. Uh, Facebook had some issue, scalability issues because probably they are using port 443 and with many, many different bits. And they are probably not using namespace. So they had this issue of having uh, to do a lot of binds with VIP, a specific IP address, and the same port. So dispatch um, uh, address this issue. Um, then I will talk a bit uh, about um, ongoing developments. Um, I will talk a bit about TCP DDP um, um, and TCP Direct. So the, the, the general idea of about that is to have some new form of um, zero copy on the receive path by allowing uh, the NIC to split the headers and put the headers in the host memory, while the payload can be put arbitrary in different device like GPU, TPU, or even something else. So uh, it's the ability to run the Linux TCP stack, but the payload will be entirely in some, some something controlled by another entity like user space. So yeah, that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, TCP direct is kind of the same thing, um, but different needs. And so in the case of TCP direct, um, we want to be able to have incoming packets um, into particular, let's say, GPU, but with no hard requirement about um, sequence space. Um, while DDP had some reordering issues, so if, if you had holes or retransmit, um, it was clearly um, so a problem for DDP. While for TCP Direct, we don't care because we are going. We want to provide a scatter gather list for user space to consume the, the page in arbitrary uh, location, but they, they would still be page owned by the user. So that's landing on the proper node or proper space, but without any requirement of about um, the continuity of the sequence. Uh, so I will talk a bit about PSP. Uh, maybe you heard about PSP, uh, which has been upstream um, uh, by Google recently. So PSP is um, a way to do encryption and decryption at line rate without, uh, you know, complexity, the, the complexity we have with other um, variants of encry encryption. Um, 
so Google is uh, heavily using PSP. Um, so we reach line right. So all the numbers I gave earlier about uh, big TCP, whatever, that's with or without PSP, doesn't matter. PSP just add some uh, header. Um, so it's actually a UDP header plus uh, PSP trail. So it's, it adds some overhead. It's uh, like any uncap. But uh, globally, if you are using big MTU, like a 4K MTU or even more 9K, um, this added cost is very, very small. So hopefully the TCP implementation can be upstream soon. Um, I hope. Uh, I will, yeah, I know a lot of people are waiting for that. So, yeah. Then I will talk a bit about um, more more stuff uh, like PLB. Uh, PLB uh, was also published um, recently. Uh, we are using that at Google to reshuffle constantly um, packets over the network based on the IPv6 flow ID. Um, so whenever TCP experiments uh, some condition or some retransmit, whatever, uh, it change um, the flow ID. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it is in the Trim Linux kernel. Um, a new patch series should come soon uh, to add some extra um, signal about uh, ECN. So basically extending DCTCP to also from this reshuffling of flow ID under some specific condition um, situation. Then I will talk a bit about uh, TCPAO, which uh, as we have seen multiple patcheries in the last year, um, but I don't know. Uh, they are quite complex to, to look, and it seems there are two different teams proposing their own uh, patch set, so it's going. To, we have to decide which one to to take. So, and I would like to for this team to decide them, themselves instead of just asking us to to decide. And you know, oh, we are the maintainer, so we are we know everything, so we should decide for you. Ah, I hope that 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 situation will be solved. Yeah, so um, I think I'm at the end of the presentation. Um, conclusion, TCP is still strong. Uh, many, many improvements over the year after year, month after month. So I want to, um, to restate that the major bottleneck today are not really TCP stack per se, but it's more, more MM layer, scheduler layer, um, the memory bandwidth uh, limitation and interrupt latency and so on, so on. So very often um, people complain about TCP being, being slow, but actually uh, I find it quite fast today. So let's continue to make TCP even better in the future. Thank you. Uh, now is the time for questions. Wow, that video was timed to perfection. There must be some amazing flow control going on. Uh, mics, uh, I have one somewhere. The mics go. Ah, there. Jamal took it. I think this question is about PSP. So um, we did have some discussion here about PSP today as well. And is the plan to uh, upstream it to Linux kernel or uh, to use a space or both? And uh, uh, the second question is about standardization like IETF and things like that. Um, uh, do you want to talk some about that? Yeah, so PSP, um, we m mostly use PSP uh, for TCP uh, in pro production kernel. At Google, so we plan to trim this part. Um, the the thing is, we did a, our first implementation years ago has been done a bit um, in a hacky way, and so we want to make that a bit better for upstream before trimming that. So this work is uh, ongoing. So hopefully, it should be done in the following month. Um, Eric, I have a follow-on on that. You specifically said PSP for TCP. Is that uh, yeah? So it's going to be restricted to just TCP packets. 
No, no, our implementation like uh, in TCP. So, but no, nothing prevents anyone from using PSP for other protocols, right? I mean, what what I with what we did was integrating uh, PSP in PS, uh, in TCP. So basically, having a way of uh, socket option to turn on or control PSP use or on the particular socket. Because let's say you turn on PSP on a socket, you don't want a non-encrypted packet incoming in non-encrypted packet to be accepted, even if the TCP sequence uh, and act number uh, match with your state. You don't want them to to be injected in your data flow. So there are additional steps to do in the TCP stack for that. Eric, do you also want to comment on the IETF? Like, is there any plan for going through the standardization or no? About PSP or about what? About PSP. Um, I don't know. I don't have the... Um, uh, I don't know the details about that. Okay. Um. Right here. Let's see it. Uh, this one. Yeah, I guess this one is working. Hi, Eric. Um, about the TCP AO patch sets. So at, at LPC in Dublin, I did talk to Dimitri and sent an email to Leonard as well saying, you know, it's kind of difficult for maintainers to go through two very large patch sets and, you know, understand subtle differences between those implementations and basically pushing both of them to comment on the others and see if they can converge and note differences and only really have maintainers come in if there's some kind of fundamental disagreement like one of the big ones is how much complexity is in kernel space versus user space right and so yeah, yeah i, I kind of like that stance of let's keep pushing them to kind of resolve those differences to to converge on something yeah absolutely Any other questions in the audience? Yeah. He's gone behind the line <laughs> and ducking hard. Um, okay, in that case. In that case, thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you for keeping the TCP flame alive. Uh, as you may have heard, there were some interesting conversations around TCP today. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's it's an interesting thing, right? I don't think it's uh, religion. It's something that's widely deployed. It's good if it works well. If there are better things, we should support that too. Um, all right. So that's it. I think that's a wrap for today. Uh, see you. See everybody bright and early tomorrow morning. <laughs>